you're assigning one, two, and three to the bar. Yeah. One would be three thousand, one would be six hundred and four, one would be uh, twenty three. And then you just go down the line until you find one. And that's like that's like episode one. It's not your credit. It's not your Using the as a way to order is relatively consistent. Yeah, so it's not supposed to be a secret one. So you can't, you're not supposed to be a match the After I figured it out, like I, like I, I don't know how I came back to it. Let's get started. Um, so thanks. Uh, uh, so I trust everyone. I'm just everyone turned in. Um, so, um, so, so everyone turned in the homework too. That was that was due 15 minutes ago. Um, so there's a uh, homework three that's due due next week. Um, I I think homework three should be kind of um, even simpler than the than the first two homeworks. Um, hopefully, the first part you you of that homework we we've, we've covered all of, uh, all that stuff. Um, so what we've covered all that stuff already in class. There's one part from uh, the the second part of the homework that we haven't quite um, that we haven't quite covered yet. I was I meant to cover um, it last week, but I'm but I I have delayed it until today. So we've got a lot to cover because I'm going to squeeze a bit more into this lecture that we didn't quite get to cover last week Wednesday, and then um, we're the last. Um, at least last five minutes, I want to talk about these kind of the, these ethical issues and uh, in dealing with these sort of um, these the these 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 sort of representations that 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 we'll be talking about. Um, so okay, so we'll be talking about the approximate. Um, so the. The approximate nearest neighbor problem in this in this lecture, and in particular, I'm I'm I I'm gonna um, um, so so I'm gonna focus on on the Euclidean distance, um, right? So the the distance between two points we'll talk about is gonna be the the um, so the two norm between them. So that means that these a and b is going to be in this d in this um, so in this d dimension Euclidean space. Um, so say a is is going to be um, going to represent each of the data points as a one, a two, up to a d. Um, and then the the distance is just the straight line distance. So if I imagine those points as having two coordinates, and I draw the straight line between them, this is just the uh, the analog of this distance in um, so so um, so in any um, um, so in like like any higher dimension. And so even if we're dealing with data that looks like this in in like two dimensions, this is probably the most um, like like the most common the most common distance to use. Although in the lecture on Monday we talked about a variety of other distances that that you could use in, in, in two dimensions that would make sense. Even in a lot of these extend the higher dimensions. But if you're not sure what to use, this is probably the default. Um, and if you've taken the the 3190 class. 
you, you've probably seen that this distance shows up within the analysis of kind of a lot of algorithms as well. And we'll, we'll, and so, so we'll, and, and so we'll see that throughout the rest of the semester. Um, um, but, but before I get started, I, um, so, so I just want to convey to you that it's, um, so, so it's very common to have some, um, 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 so to, to, um, to, um, so it's very common to start with some form of raw data that, that we don't know how to analyze um, kind of um, the distance between, <laughs> between two of the data points. It could be some, so it could, could be something like some documents or some, or some pictures or some customers in, a, in, 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 in like a database. But most kind of um, <laughs> types of data we have, it's, it's very common to try and map this data into this. Um, so each, each data point, so, so somehow maps to an element in, so, um, so, so in some d-dimensional Euclidean space. And usually, um, so d is large. Um, and so it's often the case that we get more kind of more representation power as the as the dimension of the space gets larger, and it's fairly similar to what we did with these minhash um, with these minhash signatures. Now that for those this might be a little confusing. We were not using the Euclidean distance. We're using something like the Hamming distance in between these vectors. Um, we're just measuring the the exact number of uh, of, of of, of the times the coordinates were, were matching exactly. But it's, it's much more common to map to Euclidean distance. Um, and so, um, so, um, so some examples um, are, um, so if we use the bag of word, um, so <laughs> the representation of a document where we just, there's this a large number of coordinates, and we count um, each coordinate corresponds with the word, and we count how, how many times the word occurs in the document, and that's the coordinate that corresponds with this word. This is a, a so it is is like a very high dimensional representation. D there could be like could could be like ten thousand or or like a hundred thousand. Um, I mentioned that the cosine distance is sometimes more popular with this, but sometimes people use the Euclidean distance as well. Um, so, so, um, so, so, so another example are these word um, vector, um, so M, um, so the, these word vector embeddings, which we're going to talk about again at the end of the lecture, what these are doing is a little bit different. Instead of um, a document being mapped to a vector, it's taking, um, looking at a, a bunch of documents, say all the pages on Wikipedia, and trying to map each word into a vector. Um, and this is this. These are variants and extensions of these are now used within most um, are used within most natural language processing pipelines. Okay, so it's not necessarily that they just use these to do the analysis, but they're kind of the first step. They have some big deep learning approach, but they first kind of take the text and they, they vectorize each word in the text into this representation often. That way, if I replace a word with, 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 with the synonym of that word, their vector representations are going to be very close, and it, and it can kind of understand the kind of, the, the kind of different ways of describing the same thing in, in language um, kind of using this representation. And this is kind of um, using these techniques. There are these long-standing challenges within natu natural language processing where they've, for like 20 years, they had this benchmark. They got, they were stuck on like 80% accuracy over the last, 
five or so years, these have gone up to maybe like 90% like accuracy. Just using these techniques after 20 years of like having no progress. Okay, so having this, these representations is, is like has, um, so, um, so has, has been very useful in slab analysis. Um, all right, so there's another case with is like with images. Um, and so again, you know, in the last five or ten years, how images are handled has shifted towards this, this like deep learning model where they start with a um, some with like a convolutional neural net that that they'll run on on uh, on on so on uh, on top of the images as um, and this effectively gets a representation of the image. Um, but the, this kind of there's still this important kind of Euclidean representation, which which is is like like showing up in two places. One, if I use a um, a like CNN in this in this representation, then I can often get and um, the, there's often some property within this deep net if if um, so, um, um, so, so, so if you've seen any more about these, but there's going to be some like intermediate layer, which is, and it will kind of, the net will end up having wide layers and in the process it'll squeeze down to some smaller layer, then it might expand up again. That smallest layer it ever gets to is often has Euclidean values um, on that layer, and that can be used as a, as a representation. And often the Euclidean distance between passing two images in their representation in this layer is is kind of a good kind of sense of which of the of of, of like the images are 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 going going to be similar to each other in ways that have to do with kind of the context and the and the sort of data that's been trained on. Um, there's there's also another way which are and this. Are these um, these like sift vector representations? Um, okay, and so from about the like so from about the late 1990s to about like eight years ago, this was the dominant way to do analysis on images. You would take an image and you create a bunch of these of these. These like SIF vectors. These are elements of R. Um, so of like of 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 like 120 dimensions. And what it did is it tried to kind of analyze images and find out these these the these like interesting parts. Okay. And and for each interesting part, it does something like building a convolution, um, which is which is what's happening in the and, and like the first few layers of the CNN, and um, but it just created this set of these of these data points. They're each in a hundred uh, in like 120 dimensions, and so a common first step in the analysis was to often well, I want to find does this representation appear somewhere in my data set, and maybe I I have this label. So if I have kind of um, if it works in cars, I might have the SIF vector over uh, over like the wheel of a car, and I'll have a bunch of wheels labeled, and so I'll identify that there was some vector that was corresponding to it to a label, and that it used the the Euclidean distance in um, in between these vectors as as this representation. Okay, so this is not used as as much anymore, but it was kind of like a a it, it, it was really like a forerunner of, of what the kind of the, the, uh, the current analysis are. Just to kind of quickly give you an insight into like like how this works. If you um, so, so if you've ever done any if you've ever done any sort of of, of, of like image analysis, you know you, you thought what is actually going on in in, in like a picture you've taken. So you'll know that it's actually a bunch of these pixels. There are these small squares which are all the same color. Okay, nowadays 
your, your, your phones and your screens and your cameras are so good that you can't see the individual pixels much anymore. Um, but, but like if you were in the early cameras, you could actually kind of, you could actually, you, you could actually see where the pixels were. Okay? And uh, if you zoom in far enough, you can, you can still see them. So one way would be to think about that each of these, these pixels has, has a single value. Actually, it has like these, these actually usually has like three values, the red, blue, and the green, and these mix to form a color. But if we just have it in grayscale, it just has, has a single value for each pixel. And if I have two pixels of the same size, then what's happening is I can take these and I can stretch them out into a single vector. <coughs> and then this vector could be some representation of the image. And so the and and so like before things like SIF vectors, this was often one of the most common things people could do, and they could do things. Well, this picture has a lot of blue in it, so either it's it has to do with water or it has to do with uh, with the sky, right? And so they could do analysis that way, um, <laughs> and so that was automated. Okay, and so, but that was kind of the state of the art of, of what people could do, um, unless they kind of, they knew it was a picture of a face and then there may be some other techniques. Okay, what the SIF vector is doing instead is it's saying, let's identify these, these regions, like here's one right here, and I'm gonna kind of look at this at a certain number of levels, right? And each level, I'm gonna take some center point, I'm gonna measure these, these kind of, these, uh, these areas around it, Right, so this is the, the, the center cell that I'm going to have these other cells um, outside of it. And I'm going to do this at various scales. Okay, and so this gives me um, the difference between the pink and each of the green cells, like here, is, 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 going, to get, is going to give me these eight values. Okay, and then I'm going to do this at like, um, I think like 16 different scales, and I combine these together into a vector which is 100, uh, in, in, into like 100 and, 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 and 28 dimensional. Okay, and kind of by, by changing the order I represent them, I kind of get um, that there's a way of doing this, so you can get whether this is a corner or not. If there's a big difference, in the color here and here, then I'm going to get a big value in the vector. And, and this is where it's going to stand out. I'm going to look at, at these differences. OK, and I would do this over a bunch of the different pixels and pick out the ones which actually had large values. The ones with small values means the difference was small. OK, and the ones with large values are interesting. And if they're interesting in the same way, they're probably looking at the, at the same sort of object, the same sort of corner. So it would identify, help identify these corners up here. Here's, here's another example of something we would pick out because underlying this, there's this corner of, of the boat. And so there's a big difference between the center pixel and the, <laughs> and the ones around. All right, so, so again, this relied on first taking some data, which you, there's some representation as a vector, but doing a different representation as a vector, some sort of complicated transform. <coughs> And then in order to understand the structure, I need to find the nearest neighbors of these points. The nearest neighbors of these points kind of tells me if I have some labels, I know what some of those are in some labeled data set, I can go and check those labels and that kind of gives me a good sense of what is going on inside this picture or with what this word means, how, how it relates to other words, right? Or these kind of what document is it similar to, to another document. And as we'll see in clustering, this will be the core, one of the core operations we, we have to do over and over again. Yeah? So the nearest neighbor analysis, is it on the individual squares of the image, or is it on the vector representation after the process? Yeah, so I'm going to, for, for this image, I will go and identify a bunch of um, pixels whose vector representation is going to be, be interesting. It's going to be large which means that there's kind of a, some large gradient in the, in the image, okay? And then for those, I'm gonna have another, another database of, of vectors, 128 dimensional vectors, 
which um, uh, and some of those I've had someone go through and do labels on these, for instance, right? Say this is the corner of a car. This is, or I know the pictures of a car, and so if I find a bunch of matches between these vectors and the, and vectors which are from pictures of cars, I think there's a car in the in the image. Okay, so there's another database of vectors that I have labeled typically in this case. And that, and that can be true in a lot of the other applications as well. But when I get a new object, I need to somehow put it in this vector space so I can do comparisons. Yeah, and, and so this is just kind of these three kind of more classic examples, but this comes up um, uh, like, uh, like over and over again. You can do this with time series by taking these windows and a time series, every window of length 20 kind of, um, say, stock prices at the end of the day represents like a data point in a 20 dimensional space. Or I might take the 20 different, most recent differences between the stock and its previous day. And this tells me something about how the stock is changing over time. And if I do the log of that, I take out some sort of scale properties. And so people use these representations to do analysis. Okay, and so you often want to get to this Euclidean space. And then you often want to find nearby things, which is this nearest neighbor problem. Okay. So, okay. So the first thing I want to talk about is just review the LSH for um, Euclidean. Um, um, so, um, so distance, and so we talked about these locality sensitive hashing. Um, so before. Okay, and um, if we have locality sense of hashing, we can basically, um, if we have this property where effectively the probability that the hash of a, you know, for some from some hash family <coughs> equals the hash of B is um, equal or approximately equal to the similarity between A and B. Then we can use these banding techniques to kind of build this kind of super hash table. And we can hash things together. And if they collide in any of these super hash tables, we can say these are, are going, going to probably be the ones which are, which, are through, which are nearby to each other. OK, and so that gave us something to work with a certain, um, so for like we'd have to, how we set up the hash tables depended on like, uh, like like, like having, like uh, uh, have having having like a certain notion of similarity. There's some threshold, but we can kind of do a binary search on this threshold until we have a small enough number, th and then we can check those explicitly to see which one is the closest to get a nearest name. Okay, so if we have an LSH, we can do binary search on the threshold to kind of get this <laughs> this nearest neighbor. Okay, um, okay, but in the past. This was this was exactly <coughs> equal in the case of the um, so the jacquard similarity um, we had this equal with the minhash with the triangle similarity example I gave and also with the um, and and like also with the angular similarity okay so we. First of all, I want to do this with Euclidean distance, and this has to do with the similarity. Um, I want to do, so I can kind of, for Euclidean distance, this is not quite, um, is, is, it, it is like not quite going to work. I'm not going to get the equal sign here anymore. I cannot set up hash function so it's exactly equal to a, to a similarity. First of all, I need to say for, for Euclidean, um, then I'm going to say the similarity between A and B is going to be the Euclidean dot product in between A and B. Right? So, so this is equal to I equals 1 to D of AI of BI. OK, so this is the right notion of, of, of like similarity to use. If this, if the, basically, if the, dot product gets gets larger than the um, then the Euclidean distance is is um, between two things of the same norm of the same length is going to get smaller. 
Okay, but so it's 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 so so, so it's kind of this right notion to use. But I don't have the property. This is um, I wanted to say that this has to be between zero and one, and I don't have this property anymore. Okay, so I don't have the property that this value has to be zero one, so I can't even compare it to a probability. Right? It has to be between zero and one to compare it to a probability. So I so I can't even do that. Okay, so so what I'm gonna do instead is if I think about these, if I had this similarity here and I had the probability that the hash of two things equals equals before. In the case with all these one where I had the equality, I had this straight line, right? This went from zero to one, and the probability went from zero to one. And as it got larger, kind of the similarity got larger, the probability of the hash exactly got larger. And what happened is I used this banding with some threshold to kind of transform this into this shape. And the way to think about this is that beforehand, I could say that, well, I, I want to say like there's, if the similarity is greater than this threshold, then the probability they collide is, is going to be high. This has a high probability of collision. And if the similarity is less than this threshold, if it's over here, right, then it's going to have, this is going to have a low probability of collision. Basically, I've taken this where the probability of collision is basically um, kind of, I, I've got these boxes much closer together, and I've spread them apart. There's, there's also this, this region in here, right, where I, I, I'm not trying to make any, any claims. Okay, I'm saying only if the similarity is high enough, I'm going to make a claim. If it's low enough, I'm going to make a claim. If it's kind of around the threshold, I'm not going to know, I'm not going to state, I, I, I won't state something specific about the probability. It's somewhere in between. Yeah. Um, so the graph shows on the x-axis 0, 1, but all of the stuff in blue doesn't have that restriction, right? All the stuff so, in blue. So as you were saying, if, if the similarity is in between 0 and 1, then it's a linear correlation. Yeah. Right. So, so, so this is why I did before. Right, for all of those red ones, for Jakar, Triangle, and Angular, I could apply this. Okay? And I could squeeze it so if, if it's if the similarity is small enough, I'm going to have a very low probability of collision. And if it's a high enough, it's a high probability of collision. And there's some region in between. Hopefully, it's more narrow than this, but a region in between where I don't make any guarantees. And this is basically what I got out of locality sense of hashing. Okay, and I can kind of, if this is narrow enough, I can kind of do a binary search on it and maybe some random uh, trials to kind of get a set of things which I think probably contains the nearest neighbor and then check those, check a small set explicitly. Okay, so, so this was our old strategy. With Euclidean distance, we need to do something slightly differently. And maybe your confusion is because you don't see how to do this yet. And I'm going to explain that it's it's going to be roughly the same, okay? So I'm going to instead have some some distance. This is like the Euclidean distance, okay? And I'm again, um, but now I'm going to have the I'm going to have the say the probability that the hash these hashes collide. And now what's going to happen basically is that as the distance gets smaller is, is going to decrease. So if the distance is very small, I want a high probability of colliding. If it's large, I want a low probability of colliding. Now I don't know if it's a straight line yet, right? So, so let me kind of erase this and say there's some function like this. Okay? But what I ultimately want to do, I want to amplify it so it looks something like well, if it's below this threshold, if it's the distance is small, I want a really high probability of colliding. And if it's and if and if it's um if it's large, I want a very low probability of colliding. And I want to kind of you know squeeze these and have some region here in the middle where I'm not going to say anything for sure. 
I might get a collision, I might not, I'm not going to control it, but if it's high enough, I want a low probability, the distance high enough, if it's small enough, I want a high probability. Okay, so this is all I want, <coughs> and it turns out that the whole banding technique, as long as I have this kind of decreasing function, I can kind of pick two points, and it will still amplify them in the same way. Okay, so I can still use this trick, I just need to write this out a little bit less carefully. I'm kind of a little bit in a way that's more, more complicated. I start with some boxes here, right, and I'm going to amplify these boxes where in the case of the red, I have this really nice property where I, I started with these boxes are actually touching right here. But I don't need them to start touching, I just need the separated boxes to be amplified. Okay? So, so there's a more complicated way to write this, but this is kind of the picture to have in mind. Basically, the whole banding technique will work as long as I have kind of, as the distance increases, there's going to be some separation between the small distances are more likely to collide than large distances. And then I can amplify that by combining together hatch functions. Is there a question or? Okay. Yeah. I'm still a little bit confused because you're saying in the case of Jacquard triangle and angular that the probability is equal to the same variable. Right. So that would be the case where it's a straight line. Yeah, exactly. Right. This is a straight line. Yeah. Okay. So, so for similarities that where it's not exactly equal, then you do this to get the approximation. Yeah. So I can still. Like ultimately, what I'm going to get are these these blue boxes that are these safe regions. If it's the similar is high, I have a high probability collision. That I've like a very high probability collision. And if it's low, a low probability. But there's always going to be this region in the middle where it's kind of it's kind of sloping up, and I'm going to have less control over that region. And I, I'd like to have this narrow, and and needs to be really you know amplified. But it's never going to be kind of completely just this. This, um, this kind of true kind of uh, step function. Okay, so I'm always going to have this gap, and I can get kind of the same results here with Euclidean distance. I just need as the distance increases, the probability of colliding is going to decrease. And then I can combine these together and amplify it. Okay, okay. So, uh, so I basically need. Um, Okay, so so how do I how do I come up with with a hash function like this? Um, I'm going to have a hash um, which is going to be depending on u and and so eta, and I'll take an x, and x is going to be a point in R D. U is going to be a um, uniform from. Um, I'll write this as S D minus one. So, so these are again the unit vectors in R D, right? So, so that means that that U has to be equal to one. The norm of U has to be equal to one. And and eta is going to have to be um, a a uniform number between zero and the and the threshold. And so, so this is basically the distance um, threshold. Right? So if I go back here, this is like the distance threshold is going to be roughly how I want to separate in here. Right? So this is, is going to be theta. Okay? So I'm this is and, and so this is and then this this hash function u of eta of x is going to be, I'm going to take the dot product of x with u, okay, and then I'm going to add eta, and then I'm going to do this all um, mod m. So this will go into what this is going to do is I'm going to have some data point x, I'm going to take some random vector u, what this, what the dot product is doing is it's projecting it onto here. And then with, within this vector u, I'm going to add these, these bins of each of length, um, e e each of length, um, not, not eta here, 
of length uh, tau, let's see, maybe this, maybe I need to multiply this by tau before I take the mod. Right, so I, um, okay, so I multiply it by tau, so then, and then I take the mod, <coughs> and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start repeating myself. Things will map to the same bin if they're exactly m, if they're exactly m bins apart. But usually that's far enough that it doesn't matter so much. Okay, and and so let me just write up. If this is the origin, then this distance here is eta. So this is the first distance, which is less than tau, and then I have these tau gaps. And so this tells me which bin x maps into. So is tau the same tau that's in the definition of the eta? Uh, uh, definition? Yes, yeah, so that's the threshold I want to achieve, the distance threshold. Right, so I want to know if things are closer or, or further than some threshold. Right, and so then in a hash function, is that raised to the tau? Or is yeah, well, great. Let me write this more clearly. Okay, so I'm multiplying this by tau, okay, and then um, mod m. Okay, so that, that, that means maybe I should, no, I should, I should divide, sorry, I should divide by tau, right? Because I want it to be integers. Yeah, roughly on the integers. So then divide this by tau. And all of this, take the mod m, just so I only have m, m different kind of things in my hash table. So uh, where is m coming from? What, what, what m, m, is, m is just the size of the hash table. It's just something that's sufficiently large that you're probably not going to get collisions. Okay, and then just, so when we do the dot product with you, is that just a random unit vector inside of Yes, you know? right. Okay, um, and, and I'll, I'll, that point I'll come back to. Okay, but yeah. Do we have to do floor or three? Do what? Floor or three? Oh, the floor or the, or the ceiling? Yeah, and I need to do a floor or a ceiling, otherwise, um, yeah, I guess I can put it there or before I do the mod. Yeah, depend on how you, you put it before you do the mod. Yeah, so this rounds it to an integer. Thank you. Great. Um, so okay, so let's just kind of quickly see see why this is correct. Um, I you know I don't want to go through there's. It's only a few lines of the algebra to go through it. You can look in the book. But kind of just <laughs> intuitively, if I have two points and they're close by, okay, they, if, they're, if they're sufficiently close by, I can't um, send them into bins which are, which, are, which are going to be too far apart. Right? If I have two points, x and y, which are, which are close, um, the, the furthest, on, on any projection onto you, the furthest apart they can be is their actual distance. Okay? So I, I could, they could only be in the same bin if they're within a distance tau. They can only be in the same bin if they are, um, if, um, you know, if they project in the same bin or the bin that's next to each other. Okay? And the probability that they're going to be um, kind of, you know, the, the probably that they're going to be in the same bin is going to depend on the on the distance of projection. If u is pointed kind of orthogonal to this vector between them, right? If u is kind of be like this, then they're going to always map to the same bin. But but even if the u is parallel to this, then the probability that they are in the same bin depends on this choice of of eta which is where I shift these bits. And just like the triangle inequality, this is, is, is going to be bound. OK, so if they're close, they're, they're likely, there's a good probability they're going to wind up in the same bin. And the closer they are, the more likely this is to be. Okay, if they're far apart, they could still wind up in the same bin. But that's only going to happen if u is basically orthogonal to the distance between them. So they happen to map, they kind of they get map on top of each other. Okay, so but that'll only happen if the direction u is really close to being orthogonal between them. And the further apart they are, the more orthogonal it has to be, closer to orthogonal it has to be. 
And that probability goes down as I kind of take a uniform distribution over u. Okay, so, so, so that's kind of, that's a rough idea of how it works. I just kind of prove these two properties. Like you can put numbers down to it, and you can plug them in, and you can show that this will amplify. Yeah. You end up with like a y on the other side of g when it gets not the same bit, but it's still satisfied. Yeah, it's it's closest. still fine. All it knows is it's basically yeah, it's sorting, it's projecting everything onto this one direction. Is that still okay for satisfying the property we're looking for? Like if they're kind of far apart. Yeah, but that only happens. They're only going to project to the same bit if this is orthogonal. So why, if I have another thing like a z down here? And they're, they're both going to map here, but this line between them is almost orthogonal to this u vector. If it's anything a little bit off orthogonal, they're not going to be the same thing. Yeah. And then there's some probability because of m, 1 over m probability, that they're going to, because of the things very far apart, they're going to hash this, the same bin, but that's small enough as well that you could bound. Okay. Okay, so th this is the main idea. I don't want to go into any more, any more detail on the argument unless you have a specific question. All right, OK. So you, you should pretty much be able to do it. It's, it's pretty simple to, to choose eta, to do a dot product, an offset, a floor, a mod. These are all pretty simple things to do. Um, however, I have not told you how to do this. OK, how do I choose a uniform unit vector? in d dimensions. Okay, so this is something you're going to do in your homework. Um, uniform um, u in, um, in say, s, s d minus 1. Okay? So the kind of the first thought you would you would you would probably have is it has to be um, it has has to be a a like the, so you, you you has to be a d um, it has to be an R D right so one way of doing this is to pick U I which is the kind of the ith coordinate of it say let's say U one is um, uniform in 0, 1, u2 uniform in 0, 1, up to ud <coughs> uniform in 0, 1. I can pick a uniform value between 0 and 1. This is built into, into, into most libraries. Um, okay? And then I can say, well, then u is going to be, um, and let's call these u tilde, and this is u tilde is defined this way, is going to be u tilde divided by the 2 norm of u tilde. So this will force it to be a unit vector. Okay? This, it turns out, is not going to work. Okay? This is kind of your intuition of what might work initially. But the problem is you are basically generating things in this box, and then I'm rounding them onto the sphere. Okay, so if I just generate stuff inside of the red ball and push them out to the boundary, then that would be okay. But I'm generating more stuff here in the corners, and these are going to be pushed down onto the boundary as well. And so I'm more likely to pick stuff on the on the boundaries here. Okay, and and so this seems like maybe it's not a big deal. Maybe I can do maybe I can do something like rejection sampling. Where I pick a point that falls inside the ball, well, I project it out. I mean, if it falls, if, if it falls outside the ball, I throw it away and I and like I try this over again. Okay, but this this turns out in high dimensions, this works very poorly. Um, so a, as an illustration of this, um, kind of uh, where's this? Um, so, um, so if, it, if I, if, so, um, um, 
So what's the so um so, so if I uh, let me see if I get this example right. Um, so if, if I take a ball, a ball of of um, of radius one in in R D, the the volume of this ball is turns out the um, the volume of this is going to turn out to be pi to the d over two uh, times the gamma function of d over two plus one. And this is, oh, so, yeah, it can multiply by the radius to the power d. So let's just say it's the radius is 1. Okay, so, the, and this is approximately pi over d over 2 divided by d over 2, um, so, so factorial, okay? So if you don't know what this gamma function is, it's a pretty weird function. But on the, um, I think on the even or the odd numbers, it happens to be d over two factorial. Okay. So um, okay, where is whereas if I look at the um, and so that would be if this ball was radius one, the the box um, of of kind of of radius one is going to be a two by two by two two box. So its volume is going to be two to the d. Okay? So the, the volume of the box of radius one is growing exponentially in d. The volume of the ball, well what's going on here? This is pi to the d over two and this is d over two factorial. D over two factorial is bigger than pi to the d over two starting around four or something like that. Right, this is pi times pi times pi d over two times. This is one times two times three times four up to d over two. Right, so for most of those values, as soon as I get to like four, then each of those volumes I'm multiplying are going to be larger than pi. Right, so I, if so, this one will be less than one. So this quantity for d greater than like four is less than one. Right, so th this one is less than one, and this one grows exponentially with d. This gets really, really big. So the probability of picking something in the box, but not in the ball, goes exponentially closer to one. So this rejection sampling strategy fails. Suppose that we use the one norm instead of the two norm of normalizing it. The 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 one norm that will. Um, there's, or I guess like, it's not going to help. That's going to that's going to give me something basically on here instead, and the problem is going to be even worse. Effectively, um, if I wanted to get something that had a norm of one, a one norm of one, then that's going to be even smaller ball. The L infinity ball, the L two, the L one ball, right? And so I'm, I'm going to have even a smaller um, probability of. Uh, of uh, of being success in that case. All right. Okay. The good news is that it turns out there is a good a good solution. Okay. So if I want to generate a um, so a um, if <laughs> if I want to generate a um, so, some um, so, so, um, so some random variable u that's that, that's here. What I can do is I can generate a um, a so so, um, so 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 like a Gaussian random variable g from the like normal distribution. This is one over two pi to the d over two e to the negative x squared. Okay, so the, this is this standard kind of multivariate normal, the Gaussian distribution. I can generate a g according to this distribution, and then I can just set u equals g over the uh, over the two norm of g. 
Okay, so I can just normalize G. The Gaussian distribution, it turns out, is, is going to be symmetric in every direction. So it's not going to have these corner effects as before. So it's, it's you know, I, I can just use these Gaussian random variables instead. Okay, so now we need to generate one of these, one of these Gaussian random variables. It turns out that if G is in this d-dimensional Gaussian distribution, then um, each GI, so um, if if like G, if G is equal to G1, G2, up to GD, then each GI is going to be in a, is, is going to be drawn from a, 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 a like one-dimensional Gaussian distribution. Okay, Gaussian distribution again has a special property that its coordinates are decomposable. So if I look at any one coordinate, that one looks like a Gaussian distribution, just that one coordinate, which is just, <laughs> just a normal distribution. Okay, and a normal distribution, you can generate um, a normal random variable from, from two from 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 you you can generate this from 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 two from from two uniform random variables. So there's a, something called this um, so this box Mueller transform, which is going to be that G is equal to negative two natural log of U one times um, I want to take the the square root of this times the cosine of two. I didn't give myself enough space here. Okay. Um, of of two pi u two. Okay. So so this gives me if I take uniform random variables um, u one and u two and I take negative 2 times the natural log of u1 square root times cosine of 2 pi u2, this gives me a, a Gaussian random variable. Okay, So if, if I have these built-in operations, I can generate uniform random variables, I can get a Gaussian random variable, I do d of these, and I normalize, and this gives me a random, um, a, a like, like random unit vector. Okay? It turns out if I normalize the Gaussian properly, I don't even kind of, it's going to be normalized on average as well. And we'll see this later in the semester also. Okay. But this is how we generate these uniform red variables um, that are, that are um, uniform unit vectors in, in, in these high dimensional spaces. Okay. Okay, and this is in the notes. So, but but you can also this is also a, is a built-in function in most uh, most software packages. So, in your homework, you can use one of the built-in functions. But if you if you want to do it from just a uniform random variable, which you can do by a sequence of bits, then this is how you can do it. Okay, cool. So, um, and th there are general. I'll mention there are generalizations of this instead of a Gaussian. To generate, if you generate them from a Cauchy instead, you get the right thing for a uniform. Um, it, it gives you the right thing for the L1 ball. If I want things that are uni uniform on the high dimensional L1 ball, which uh, there, I might mention some uses for that later in the semester, then if I generate from a Cauchy random variable, and there's these things called p stable random variables, and okay, there's some discussion in the notes if you want to see that. Um, so, so okay. So um, I want to quickly tell you that um, okay. So so if I want to find high-dimensional nearest neighbors, so high d um, so, um, so 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 like nearest neighbors, then there are kind of three options. There's <laughs> there's there's using locality sense of hashing, right? And, and this is for um, Euclidean. Okay, so there's also using um, so like some data structures. Um, so based on trees, and I'll say a few more minutes about this. 
And then something that has come to my attention is starting to kind of win out in these, um, these, there are these online contests for how fast you can do this. There's, <laughs> there's things built on, on uh, um, so, so there, there, these, the, these things built on graphs. What you do is you take a bunch of data points, you connect every data point to something like its key nearest neighbors, but a little it needs to be a little bit different. And then from you start with one point, and with the query, you see if any of its neighbors are closer distance, then you move to that neighbor and you, and you recursively do this. You follow the graph in a greedy fashion un until, you, until you get to a local minimum. And these, under weird situations, actually sometimes work. And so some of the best software out there actually uses this graph approach. Um, OK, I just don't have much more to say about that, but just kind of this is a, something that I think it's an old idea, it turns out, but it's a fairly new development that these are actually um, are, are becoming competitive. Um, so OK, so this idea of data structures with trees, we had mentioned earlier that if your data is one dimensional, you can build a binary tree and then you can find the nearest neighbors in, in one dimension. In two dimensions, it turns out you can, you can do something similar. You can think of having these, these data points in two dimensions, and you can build this structure on top of them that's um, so, so, um, so the structure is, is this structure I'm drawing is, is <coughs> Um, 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 so this is called the Voronoi diagram, and what it does is it decomposes the plane or higher dimensions into a number of cells. And if I have a query in here, if it's in this cell, I know this is the nearest neighbor. It exactly decomposes it in this way. And it turns out you can build something like a two-dimensional binary tree on top of this and get kind of the nearest neighbor query in in so in, 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 in like log n time again. OK, the problem is in, in, if I do this in, in high dimensions instead, the complexity of this becomes something like n to the d over 2 um, the ceiling. OK, so the, the description complexity of this, the number of kind of intersection points and edges and faces in this Voronoi diagram grows exponentially with d. So if I want to build a data structure which exactly answers the nearest neighbor queries, um, then I either need to kind of check every distance or I need to build this structure. And this structure is exponential in D. So it's basically hopeless to do this exactly in, in, in high dimensional space. Yeah. Um, so with this strategy, what if you uh, place a query on the boundary? Yeah, then it's going to be equal distance from these two points. This vertex is equal distance from these three points. <laughs> that's right on the, on this corner here. So that's the structure that this is encoded. So if it's if it's on there, then I know I'm exactly equal distance. Um, it's unlikely you'll be exactly on the boundary um, with with imprecision issues and stuff like that. But I guess I'm confused because if you're drawing a box around every point, like what's well, it's not a box. It's like these cells. These cells. Okay. Yeah. And this works in 2D. You can do this in 2D, and you can get log in query time. I can basically take these cells, and then I turn them into these trapezoids, um, and I extend the trapezoids up in some cases. And, um, and then basically I do a one-dimensional binary search to figure out which kind of subsection to go into, and then within each subsection I do another binary search. And there's a way to get this to work so you can query and log. It's like two times log n time, um, even in the worst case. Okay. Um, so I can do this in 2D, but I cannot do this in high D. I cannot do exact nearest neighbors. So there have been a bunch of these approximate nearest neighbor structures. Okay, and these are often built on these things like these KD trees. So a KD tree is something that is kind of recursively splitting the points, so based on the medium. So half are on this side, half are on this side. That corresponds with this split here. Then at the next level down, 
I split so half are above and half are below. Right, that's where these two splits. Then the next level down is going to course split four and five, and it's going to be this split here. That's nine and ten. He splits in, and so on down. I'm kind of doing a space decomposition by instead of doing a binary tree sort of split on the median, I'm doing by alternating dimensions, and I can do this in in high dimensions. Okay, and then to do a query. I can, on a, on a query point, I can say, well, let's look at the closest point in this cell. Okay, that's P7. And then I can look at the ball around this query point. And if the ball intersects other cells, I need to check these other cells too, because there might be a point right here. So then I kind of go back, so I check in, the, in some leaf node. And then I go back up, but hopefully I don't have to search too much of the tree to rule it out. I can go and look at here and say, well, there's nothing below this line, right, which corresponds with uh, kind of here or something like this. I guess P7 was maybe in, in this subtree here. So, so, so maybe that doesn't quite work. But then, you know, I, I don't have to check the whole tree. I basically only need to check this part of the tree. So I need to go down and check this part of the tree, and I explicitly, so it's, it's, this often works pretty quick in practice, in low dimensions. I can get up to about 12 dimensions doing this. So, so maybe D equals 12. But after that, this starts to break down. What, you can get this to work in higher dimensions, even higher dimensions as well, but I need to choose my splits more carefully. I should have those depend on the data. I should find the single best split that separates the data, kind of the highest variance direction, and cut that in half. And there are a variety of heuristics to do that, but that can work up to hundreds of dimensions, assuming the data is somehow nice on some lower dimensional kind of subspace. Okay, and, and that can maybe get up to hundreds of dimensions. Yeah. How are these ones split then? These are just, I, I alternate coordinates. I split on the coordinate axis. Gotcha. So if, if you're in low dimensions, this is faster to implement because I just need to look at the pre coordinate that's a single number. Or if I pick another split, I need to take a dot product or something else to, gotcha. to measure, which looks at all the coordinates. And you're in high dimensions, so that actually takes a factor of 100 difference in time. Yeah. But it, it can, it, it's worth it. You can get up to about 100 dimensions or so. After that, you probably want to use um, LSH. For sure. LSH is going to be competitive above 12 um, with these, but in lower dimensions, some version of this will actually might work a little bit better. Okay. And, and you really need to use approximation. You want to kind of, um, you, you don't want to find the exact nearest neighbor. If you do the approximate nearest neighbor, that's when they're scalable. But I, okay. Okay. Good. So I, I kind of rushed through the end of this lecture, but I. I want to stop. Okay, so so I want to stop and talk a little bit about these word vector embeddings and this representation for the last 15 minutes, um, 15 20 minutes. Okay, so um, so word um, vectors and um, and bias. Or, I don't know. Bias is a, <laughs> is is the right word here. Maybe I should say. You know, I, like I don't want to necessarily put a judgment on these things here, but and um, as, uh, association. Okay, so these word vector embeddings are these things that will take a word, like um, you know, like the the word the word can be like um, nurse, and this maps it to a vector nurse, which is going to be in like. Um, in, in so something like 300 dimensions. Okay, and so if I if I have another word like um, like um, like nurse and doctor, okay. Um, so um, <coughs> the doctor, this will also be in 300 dimensions. And so, but the way they're placed in there is that. If words are used in similar context, if the, we're doing these, these are based on these um, continuous bag of words models. So if they're used in similar sentences, 
then they should be embedded so they're close to each other. Okay? So if text um, context is um, is um, so is going to be um, similar then to uh, um, words <coughs> have um, small say um, 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 so then should have a small cosine distance. Okay, and so you know what they do to create these is they collect lots of text and they create all these windows around every instance of a word. Okay, and then they'll they'll they collect these vectors and then there's some nonlinear transformation they do. They try and say if the contexts are similar, so these vectors that keep track of all the words and how often they occurred in in these windows nearby. If those vectors are similar, um, and some transformation of them, um, then I'm going to, and those are really high dimensional vectors, like 100,000 dimensions. I'm going to embed them in a 300 dimensional space so that they're still similar. Okay, and to create these embeddings, there's a fairly complicated, um, like, a learning process that of, of how they create them. But that's what it's trying to preserve. If the context is similar, they should be in a similar spot. Okay, and so th as I mentioned, this has helped with a lot of tasks within natural language processing because words which are synonyms, say car and truck, um, I can swap one with, with the other and the meaning does not change too much. And this kind of, people have tried to do this manually in the past by keeping tracks of, of, of lists of synonyms of words and this just works better. Okay, but one of the issues that, that has occurred. And, and so if you check similarities against these lists of similarities that, that, these, uh, that these people had, you know, it, 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 was, it, was, it was performing well on tasks. How well can I recover similarities in a way that's automated? Okay, but there's also some things where um, if I embed the word for man, and I embed the word for, um, so, so like woman, and then I have them betting for the word like king. I can think of. I want to do something. I want to do so. So. Um, so. Um, so. So I want to do something. I want to do something like an analogy. I want to do man is to woman. As as king. Is to something, right? If you take the SAT or ACT, you probably had to answer questions like this. And I can use the word vector and banks to do this. I can create a vector from man to woman by just subtracting this is V woman minus V man. And that gives me this blue vector. And then I can take this and I can add it to V king. So basically, I'm taking this red vector and then I'm adding it here. Okay, it's going to give me this. This is a new vector in this 300 dimensional space. Okay, and then there's going to be a bunch of words in my, in my data set that are also being embedding, embedded. And the hope is that the closest one is going to be something like queen. Okay, so if I do this operation, I do this vector addition. And I, and, I, and I edit the king that the closest vector is, is going to be queen, or it's going to appear in the top five, something like that. So I want to be able to answer um, queen here. OK, so, um, so this part is, is actually pretty cool. This was kind of an, an, an unexpected result. Um, and these are now used, used everywhere. But it turns out that there's, there's this direction which is encoding gender. Okay, so if I look at this man-woman direction here, it's encoding gender, and if you can guess what else is along this um, this axis, is that a word like um, like doctor is over here, and a word like nurse is over here. Um, women um, tend to be like this; they're statistically discussed as being nurses, 
and, and men are more likely to statistically being discussed as being doctors. Um, but then these are being used within some, um, some software for things like trying to automate hiring for applications into med school. They're using these to try and automatically process things. OK, so th this is kind of, um, I pointed to this paper on, on Monday that discussed and kind of, um, and so this started to reveal um, some of these issues. Um, OK, I, I, this is what I wanted to point out. Um, I wonder if people have any comments or thoughts on this, or if they have any kind of ideas of what to do about this. Should we do anything about this? If it really has higher performance to use these, should we keep using them? Or is this going to be a problem in that it might affect um, hiring decisions, which aren't, aren't necessarily fair? If I search, OK, so if I put someone's name and their resume into here, I say, are they a good fit for a doctor? Um, if, if they're male, that might be more likely. And if you're trying to operationalize like things like admissions decisions, right? If you're obviously trying to operationalize a procedure that's trying to be unbiased, right? And to everyone. Um, but if the data you're drawing from is itself biased, you're operationalizing that bias and then using that as a, a foundation for whatever like social decision strategy you end up using. And so it's not like there's a clear cut answer as to how to quote unquote rectify it. But clearly, if you're trying to operation, like your goal is an unbiased system, if your ground truth is biased, that's not like, it's not like wash your hands clean kind of thing. Right? That, mm -hmm. that gets built into the system and keep going. Yeah, so, so there are a lot of people who, who go out there and say, well, I used an algorithm, I used machine learning, so it, it can't be biased. Right, and this, this, well, no, I, you know, I, it's it's good all of you are laughing about this uh, because you you're seeing through this statement, but most people don't see through this, right? They don't know enough about or haven't thought about these issues. Um, actually, this data is often collected, so the, the 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 most one of the most common data sets to create these embeddings from is like is like all of Wikipedia, or like there's this common crawl, which is like everything on, <laughs> on like the internet. I mean, they're just trying to find as much text as they can. They're, they're not trying for the text to be biased. Was, that, was there another comment? Yeah, so one thing that I think about is they're making the, like the, in your example, they're making the decision based on just the number of men who are doctors. Um, I would say that when you go to hire someone, it should be more of a qualitative thing. Like, can we look for aspects in a person that would make them a good doctor or a bad doctor or something like that, right? So maybe looking at data that's more qualitative um, than just quantitative, like putting people into categories. I mean, I don't know. From, just from like a pure hiring perspective or admissions perspective, you want to look at that too. So, might be worth to consider other data points. And I don't know how gender is practiced. Yeah, so, um, so, um, so that, you know, um, so, so there, I mean, you think, okay, we, we shouldn't do quantitative decisions, you know, decisions based on these quantitative things. You know, this class is mainly all about, um, in, 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 like in what ways you can make decisions using quantitative approaches. Um, you know, the pushback on that and why people started trying to do this is the thought that, well, if it's just qualitative, I'm more likely to let my own personal or even unknown biases kind of, um, kind of um, seep into this process. So I'm involved in um, um, kind of, I, I've been involved in like the admissions process before and then we're involved in new hiring of new faculty. And every year I have to do training about what, how to make these decisions, try and make them unbiased, where you have to make them, you can look at qualitative things, but you have to apply the same 
uh, standard to everyone. So you kind of preset what questions you're going to ask people. Um, because if you don't do this, it's pretty well known, or there's uh, one of the most famous studies was brought into question recently, but, um, but, but it's, it's kind of a lot of people believe that uh, if you don't, if you're not looking at quantitative things, qualitative things, your personal or maybe subconscious biases are also going to <laughs> seep into the process. So it's, you know, if you just do it qualitatively, which is what we've been doing in the past, well, if you look at kind of statistics of who's been hired in certain situations, it's not necessarily been any more fair than what this is doing, right? The statistics in hiring, you know, there's, there are these companies that, that try and automate hiring, and they'll say, well, I'm going to try and predict if this person will be successful in the job. Where do they get the data to make the prediction? Who has been in the job in the past? People on the job in the past may have been biased towards a certain type of person. And, and so they tend to have a lot more data from a certain type of person in a job. And, and that, so, so that's just kind of influencing, um, um, so like what these, you know, um, how it's, um, so like the ways it's, it, it's trying to automate this process. Yeah. Could you go one step further and turn this into an automated system to detect bias? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you can look at this, and you'll see just about any sort of um, for most. You, you need a really large enough corpus of text, like all of Wikipedia is like on the low end of the size in order to create good embeddings. But in any everything we've tried this on, this gender relation always shows up. There are other relations based on age or um, country of origin that that sh that, um, that 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 show up in these ways. There are ways you can measure them, but they're not as kind of distinct as, as gender. So this gives you a way of, of 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 kind of identifying if there is bias. But um, I, I think people believe that if it exists in the system, but there's still controversy. Um, about whether we should do something about it, or we should just try and make the best predictions possible. Um, yep. I think you kind of talked, like, I have no answers, but a couple, like, I think questions that are important to ask is basically, like, how is it being used? Like, what are you using this particular thing for? I think that's, like, the first question you should be asking, right? Um, the second question is, like, what are you comparing it against? Right, like if you're looking at like what kind of bias already exists in the system, so you're like this this problem has this system has problems, but does this have more problems or less problems? Like the famous example is just like car crashes, right? You can't make a car that's going to be 100% efficient and never get someone in a car crash ever. But if you can lower that number below the human error rate, then it's still a net positive, right? Um, one way where it gets a little weird in situations like this, though, is that um, like what? Like you can assume that bias is somewhat distributed across people if you're like in a hiring process, right? So everybody's going to have different bias, and then some of those biases might cancel out. Like some people might like redheads more than blondes, more than brunettes, right? And that'll roughly, hopefully, cancel it out. You know, maybe it doesn't, but uh, that's kind of like the assumption. But if you had a single company that was the best hiring software, and there was only one algorithm essentially on the market that had the monopoly on that, now you don't have the ability to be able to uh, like have that distribution of different types of bias, and now you're kind of stuck with one. And like Especially if like, you look at like government stuff, right? I think that's where it really kind of gets a little strange, is that the government is going to have a monopoly, they're not going to make 14 different um, you know, algorithms to address some kind of situation, there's going to be one algorithm to address an algorithm for everybody. Yeah, so I, I think there are about six companies I know which are doing this. One of the larger ones is actually based in Utah. Um, but th th they're, they're all using basically the same word vector embedding as the back end, or so, some version of them. Um, this is also used not just in hiring, in admissions process, in decisions about whether it's so much getting parole, um, um, parole out of jail, um, that has other biases that show up in there. What, now it's 
I believe it's starting to be used, uh, although I don't know exactly how those work, but in whether someone from outside the U.S. is allowed to come into the country, if, if they don't have like U.S. citizenship, they may look at their social media and run it through something like this. Um, so it's it's being used, but they're all based on this similar kind of these these kind of the same basic word vector embeddings. So that 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 same bias is incorporated into the different um, in different ways on top of it, but in, in kind of a way that's hard to untangle. So, yeah. In your opinion, would this be this process be an unbiased reflection of the data from which it's drawn, and in this case, potentially be used, um, say, in these selection processes, whether it's parole or hiring, to try to quantify what sort of bias needs to be mitigated in the process? Yeah, so the, it's an interesting point. So um, I think people roughly agree with that, that this is an it's, it's a fairly unbiased reflection of the data from which it's drawn. So if you know something about the data, there's some evidence, I think this is less understood, of that doing this sort of thing can amplify biases. So if there is bias, it may amplify even more of it. So if you random, even if it's, there's some randomness in here, so it might take, have some random bias and that might get amplified in the process. But if, if you're right, if the data itself is good, then, then and you can argue that every step is unbiased, then, then maybe you can get an unbiased algorithm out. Um, there, there are definitely research trying to do that now, or to take the algorithms and unbias them. Un if I can unbias these, then hopefully everything downstream is unbiased. Right? And yeah, one technique is to project against this vector. trying to unbias them, but looking at where the bias comes in, and then yeah. people were actually researching, OK, you know, sometimes there are programs where they say, uh, we're going to make sure we hire exactly five people or five minutes to figure out a line. If people ever look at this and try to use this as a way to quantify where they're going to be. Yeah, the, it's an interesting point. I don't, I don't know of, like, for the studies where this would be applied, I don't know of large enough data sets where we could, we could actually do that. Within text, we've done experiments where we've taken all the instances of he and she and other a bunch of identified gendered words like man and woman and flip them randomly when we put it through the process. And there was still bias showed up in the in the representation along. There was still a gender axis because other things like names represented you know genders and those carried the same connotations. Say nurse and doctor. And we didn't know all the names or how to do kind of a randomly swapping of those. So I think it's it's hard to uh, get perfectly unbiased data, but in controlled studies and in medicine, they try and do this within their studies. They try and try and fix the bias and, and so on. I think we're out of, almost out of time, but we'll take one more question if you need to leave. That's okay. So if you knew the rates of type one, and type two errors in studies, yeah. So the, 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 there has been some success. Um, so there's like some papers by like. Um, so, so by like Hai Wei Chen, who's the second author in the paper, I have a reference who's kind of had, had these ways of putting these regularizer on the learning process that is kind of inverse to the kind of uh, um, the calculated bias on, under certain parameters. And that has actually improved the learning performance while hopefully um, reducing the amount of bias in the process as well. And so, so, so there is some hope to do some stuff like this. And this is one avenue some people are taking. And I guess uh, how is bias measured? Um, like there's like some structural bias. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's something like that. I, I don't remember exactly.